Hello. Welcome to the first Penn Engineering Graduate Admissions Webinar. We're happy you're here to join us and to learn more about our master's program. As you know, many of our programs have an application deadline of February 1st, so it's perfect timing for you to be here with us and ask questions that'll help you decide which program is best for you. So today um, I'm joined by several faculty, but first I'll introduce myself. My name is Christina Burton. I'm the Associate Director of Graduate Admissions Operations here at Penn Engineering. Uh, one of the faculty joining me is Dr. Boon Thao Lu, who is the Associate Dean for Masters and Professional Programs at Penn Engineering. I have several other faculty with me, and they'll introduce themselves later on in the presentation when they talk about their program. So let's look at the agenda for today's discussion. Please be remember, that this webinar will be recorded. So as you see in today's agenda, I'll just give a brief introduction to the university. We'll also review why you should consider Penn Engineering for your graduate studies. We'll also look at application requirements and deadlines and program highlights that will be managed by each of our program faculty directors. And we'll have about 20 minutes to review some of your questions. And finally, we'll end with program and admissions context in case you have further questions for follow-up. So just to give you some background on the University of Pennsylvania, we are the first Ivy League institution in America. We're located in a vibrant historic city, the city of Philadelphia, which is the fifth largest city in the United States. And we were founded by the world's first engineer, Benjamin Franklin. So some important stats for you to know about the university. We are ranked number four in two very important areas for research institutions. We are among the world's most innovative universities. And we also have the fourth largest research and development expenditure, which is very important for people like you and others who are interested in pursuing research in the field of engineering. So when we think about the School of Engineering and Applied Science, it's important to note that we are one of 12 graduate schools in the University of Pennsylvania system. What you see here is pictures of six of our programs, six of our, I'm sorry, buildings where our engineering students take classes, conduct research in labs, and are able to convene for social gatherings. Here's some important information about Penn Engineering in general. We currently have 15 master's programs, six PhD programs, and 13 research centers and institutions. And they are all um, facilitated or led by our faculty, which we currently have over 150 engineering faculty and over 2,000 graduate students. As I mentioned earlier, we are among the world's largest um, expenditure for US institutions. And so for fiscal year 2019, we spent over $130 million on research expenditures. So one thing that distinguishes Penn Engineering is our con constant pursuit of growth and expansion. So pictured here is our university president, Amy Gutman. And in the middle, you'll see um, one of our alumni, Harlan Stone. And on my right, you'll see Dr. Vijay Kumar, who is the Dean of the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. This picture represents uh, how one of our alumni gave us the largest financial gift in our history of $25 million to fund our new data science building, which should be up and running in about three years. So Penn is constantly seeking to grow and expand its reach. Another thing that draws candidates to Penn Engineering is our world-renowned faculty. Pictured here in this lovely photo, which coincidentally was among the top-ranked science photographs of 2019, is Dr. Danielle Bassett. She is a full-time faculty member in the bioengineering department, and she has won many awards for her work in outlining how the brain works. 
Another thing that draws candidates to Penn Engineering is our innovation. Pictured here are some of our current students and actually alumni who worked on the RoboCup. So they're called the U Penalizer, and you can learn more about them by the link that's featured here. And actually, we'll have one of our faculty from the robotics department speaking, and he'll perhaps highlight a little bit more on this. Finally, uh, three things really make Penn Engineering stand out. It's the network that people can create here, the opportunities that become available to our students and alumni, and the community that serves people while they're in school and also when they graduate. So let's think about how one could be considered to join the Penn Engineering community. Our application requirements are listed here. It's important to note that um, if you look below, that we have several master's programs with application deadlines for February 1st. So if you're interested in any of the programs listed there, it's important that you start and finish your application by February 1st. Another thing that I want to note for our international applicants, the TOEFL and IELTS scores uh, are required for consideration. If you have not uh, done a pro program, any university program, or graduated from a program where English is the primary medium of instruction. You'll also see that we have several other programs that have a later deadline of March 15th. We'll conduct another webinar when that uh, date approaches. So right now, I'd like to give you the opportunity to hear from some of our faculty, and we'll have four programs featured in this webinar. The first master's program is for the electrical engineering department, and Dr. Tanya Khanna will be speaking to you about what this program has to offer. Dr. Khanna, I'll mute myself and allow you to take over. Hi all, uh, my name is Dr. Tanya Khanna. Like Christina said, I'm program director of the electrical engineering master's program within the electrical and systems engineering department. Um, my, you know, my kind of background is in mixed signal VLSI design and I applied it to biomedical electronics. And so I teach uh, mixed signal VLSI, VLSI design, digital VLSI design. I also teach uh, digital signal processing. So that's just a bit about me. Um, this, I'm, I've been here at Penn for five years now, and I come by way of Cornell at MIT. So, you know, the, the master's program in electrical engineering, like this slide says, it gives students the theoretical foundation and interdisciplinary skills needed to deal with new ideas and applications um, in modern electroscience, right? A, a major advantage of the program allows you to tailor your education to your own interests. There's been a particular um, new exciting interest in the fields of data science and machine learning. And we allow for that flexibility if that's what you want to focus in. Um, we have divided the, uh, the curriculum into these three broad areas of physical devices and nanosystems, circuits and computer engineering, um, and information decision systems. And you know, to, to build off of what Christina was saying about our world-class research faculty, you know, I just want to highlight a few of our professors in those areas. Um, in information and decision systems, a recent hire we have, and he's brought to our department two new courses, one in statistics for data science and one, uh, sorry, data mining and an intro to data mining class. And those classes have been very popular, if not, you know, <laughs> full all the time. Um, and, you know, he applies his data science into machine learning and neural networks and reinforcement learning. So, you know, there's exciting, exciting new stuff going on there. In our physical devices and nanosystems, we have a new uh, addition, Troy Olson. He's also developed a few new courses for us. Uh, and his research involves MEMS devices for Internet of Things and biomedical implantables. Um, and then, you know, finally, somebody who's been a pen longer than I have, but I actually don't know how long, for uh, Dr. Fruz Alfatuni, he does work in um, uh, electrophotonic inter uh, innovations, right? And he was actually recently in our Penn Engineering Magazine. I'm sure there's a link online that you can look for it. 
And you know, he he teaches a lot of our analog IC de design classes, including integration com uh, communication systems, integrated photonic systems. Um, you know, so those are those are the the faculty we have here that you'll take classes with. Um, and you know, like it says on this slide, our student population is about 170 students. That's including both years, and our students go on to you know many different paths. Listed on this slide are just you know a list of companies that are actually all students from last year. So that list is actually larger. I pulled up the list, and you can add um, you know you can add other companies to that, like Artec, Axon. Um, you know, there's there's more than just listed there, but you can see that it's competitive. Um, additionally, you know, our, some of our students go on to PhD programs. Uh, I know currently one of my TAs, uh, most of the time my TAs are also doing research in labs. So, you know, that's not guaranteed if you come here, but that opportunity is there. You know, again, that, that faculty is looking for motivated students. And if you can uh, prove yourself to be motivated and, and you know, want to learn, you know, they're, they're willing to take you on. Um, I don't want to take up all my time. So I think, I think I'll leave it there and let you talk about the next department. Thank you, Dr. Khanna. So before we move on to the next department, I want to welcome those who just joined our first webinar. And we're hearing from different faculty representing our master's programs. Before we move on to the next one, I know a lot of you will have questions for our faculty to answer. So please utilize the chat to insert your questions. And later on in the presentation, we'll have plenty of time for your questions to be answered. So next, we'll hear from Dr. Kantha, who is the Program Director for Material Science and Engineering. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to participate in this webinar and tell you a little bit about the master's program in material science and engineering. Um, I have been uh, associated with this department for over 32 years, but I've been managing the master's program for the past 10 years. And I'm happy to tell you that not too long ago, about four years back, we were the largest ranked master's program in America. I do not have the figures from the latest years, uh, so I do not know that, but we all, for a very small department, in terms of number of faculty, we have a very vibrant and robust program in the master's uh, degree in material science. And as, I, as you can see on the slide, there are almost 90 plus students in both the years in our program. And so what makes our program so attractive to a wide class of domestic and international students the reason is material science is inherently interdisciplinary. We attract students with physics background, with chemistry background, with material science background, and also students from other engineering disciplines like chemical, bioengineering, mechanical, and so on. The reason they come to material science is, as you all probably are very well aware, material science is a science of fabricating, synthesizing, understanding new materials for all our needs in this brand, in this brand new century, or this brand new decade that we are entering just now. And uh, in order to do that, you need to be able to have a wide background, interdisciplinary background in chemistry, physics, engineering, to understand how to come up with new materials with all the properties that the world desires in innumerable applications. So the program description of the master's program, the idea is to provide students with a very broad, solid foundation in material science, which will enable you to go on and build careers in a narrow field like optics, quantum optics, or probably nanotechnology, or mechanical properties, which has always been the mainstay of engineering for, for over 200 years. And listed there are some of the companies where our graduating students from 2019 were hired. We do get quite a, a good percentage of our master's students going on to PhD programs, both in this country as well as into Europe. And listed are some of the schools that they go to. And we are very proud of the students that we send them. 
uh, to other coveted PhD programs because we hear back from faculty from those schools that the students from Penn have a solid background in material science. And uh, if, if I may just go back to the last picture, I just want to show you pictures from our graduation in May 2019, pictures of some of the awards won by material science master's students, uh, where you can see Professor Boonthal Lu and along with our Dean of Engineering, Professor Vijay Kumar, and some of the social dinners that we organize for this contingent of students. And this slide is a little bit crowded. I just want to mention that there are three routes to getting a material science degree. One is to just take graduate level courses, 10 of them. And there's a listing on the right that tells you all the courses that are currently offered in either fall or spring semester. There are other ways to get a master's program where you do eight lecture courses and do two independent study with faculty to engage in extra work that will give you an edge in those cutting edge areas, or to do a master's degree with a thesis, which is based on research done with one of our faculty from either material science or from the larger group of faculty that belong to Penn Engineering. And to enable students to engage in research, we award uh, five to eight coveted master's scholars every year that um, the Penn Engineering um, School gives, um, a, a, a gives an award to enable these students to carry out research, paying for the cost of getting supplies, using the Penn facilities to carry out your experimental work. And this is an invaluable experience for our students to then move on to either jobs in industry or engage in research or start their own companies as some of them have started doing now. So I look forward to answering your questions if you have regarding the material science program and I welcome applications from uh, many of you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kanta. So just a reminder to those of you who have just joined us, welcome. You will have an opportunity to get your questions answered by the faculty speaking, speaking today. So please utilize the chat feature to include your questions here. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Howard Hugh, who is the program director for the Masters in Mechanical Engineering and Applied Mechanics. Thank you, Dr. Hugh. Yeah. Welcome. Uh, I'm Howard Hu from uh, uh, Mechanical Engineering. The next slide. Yeah. Uh, the master's uh, in mechanical engineering uh, has about the kind of size about uh, 140 students in the program, and uh, we are, I mean, yes, very innovative and uh, uh, broad based uh, for the mechanical engineering degree uh, per se. And uh, uh, in the program, that the student uh, enrolling in the program, we declare one of these uh, five concentrations within the mechanical engineering. And the largest one, and a lot most of the students select is mechatronics and robotic robotic system, and that we also offer uh, micro and nano systems. Uh, third one is the heat transfer and the fluid mechanics and the energy related uh, area. Uh, also covers the mechanics material and the design and manufacturing. Uh, so that covers a wide uh, area of uh, expertise uh, of the faculty within the mechanical engineering. So once the students are admitted into the program, students will pick one of those concentrations so that they can select relevant courses, cover those areas, but also students select courses uh, outside their concentration to cover uh, I mean, uh, as electives uh, to cover the requirement. Uh, now, within the uh, mechanical engineering, that uh, students uh, have three, uh, mostly three options. One is uh, taking courses only. Uh, uh, that means that the student will take uh, uh, 10 courses to finish the degree requirement. Out of those 10 courses, that the uh, two courses covers uh, mathematic, I mean, mathematics, and those courses range from the engineering mathematics to machine learning to data-driven modeling to numerical methods, so there's a wide spectrum of methods that can take uh, any two of those uh, counted as uh, a mass. The second one is depending on the, the concentrations students declare, we select uh, each concentration, a core fundamental course cover the background in within that concentration. 
Then beyond the, uh, the core concentration, of course, we have uh, within the concentration, we have two more electives with, for that particular concentration. Those two electives are normally selected by the faculty within that concentration and it covers uh, me, uh, more, me extended the coverage, gave you more extended coverage uh, with, uh, for the uh, for the bad one in that concentration. Then we have additional two main general electives. That means the student within the concentration, they can select courses outside the concentration in other mechanical engineering courses. Uh, going beyond that, the student also have a main option to take three other general electives. Those courses could be in mechanical engineering or could be in the other engineering department. And for example, students taking the courses in electrical engineering, in uh, computer science, but also could be the courses outside the engineering school. And some students are interested in uh, management, for example, they can take courses in Wharton and uh, uh, accordingly, as long as uh, discuss the course selection options with their, with their faculty academic advisor. Uh, in addition to those uh, 10 courses that uh, the students select, we also implemented this, uh, what's called a seminar requirement. Students normally do not pay tuitions on those uh, two seminar courses. So we want to have students exposed to uh, most uh, cutting edge research in mechanical engineering, I mean, participating in this uh, main uh, 699 course. And also, soon we have the option of taking a career development seminar series that uh, we implemented uh, uh, just uh, uh, last year. And those include uh, the regular department seminars and something late, some other seminar courses related to their career development. Uh, so that's option number one, taking courses only. And uh, that means taking 10 courses only. And then out of the 10 courses, students can actually select to do a research uh, thesis. And uh, those research, uh, mean that the research thesis can count up to three course units. So that's option number B. And uh, we, uh, the, the school, engineering school, also implemented the option number I mean, option C that uh, in the second year, fourth semester of second year, students actually can prefer to do a academic field study option. So they can uh, prefer to spend uh, one semester in industry uh, doing an internship. And uh, that means that uh, by finishing that internship, they can come back to school and finish up their program. This is, uh, I guess, that uh, uh, we compiled the data for the uh, last uh, five years that uh, within the mechanical engineering uh, master's uh, program, uh, we basically outlined how many students applied and how many we admit and uh, how many students actually come to append. So uh, uh, overall, in the past, we have about uh, I mean, roughly 400 students on average apply into our program when we admit uh, about uh, uh, I guess uh, uh, roughly uh, about 40 percent or between 30 to 40 percent of those applicants into our program. Then at, uh, overall we basically on average uh, we have about 60. We try to manage uh, the mid on every year, every year about 50 to 60 students. And uh, the quality of students are I mean, for the students admitted into our program are very high. And you can see that uh, the average, the mean, uh, uh, the medium GPA is about uh, 3.5, uh, 3.6. Uh, so that gave you a rough uh, I mean, uh, idea that uh, uh, who are applying and how many we are admitting. And the uh, next slide showing that uh, for the class of 2019, and uh, the student join our program is 61. And here are listed, uh, they are, I mean, uh, the, the school, for the schools, they are graduate, they are receiving their bachelor's degree. And uh, so it's a widespread and it's a very international, you can see. And, uh, but uh, uh, I mean, the fonts are a little bit small. I don't know if you can <laughs> read them, but uh, if you can have the slides and you can read it a little bit later, but uh, it covers, uh, uh, all over the world, I mean, universal all over the world, and uh, uh, they uh, elite schools, I mean, uh, students, I mean, graduates from those schools are applying to us. Uh, next, 
here is, uh, I guess, uh, uh, a list of the companies, mostly companies that uh, uh, where our I mean, graduates are going. And this, uh, the list is for the graduates uh, in uh, 2019. And I try to go over uh, things. Uh, uh, when you graduate, uh, the school do an exit survey and the list of the inf uh, all the information for that particular uh, class. And uh, uh, the data for 2019 is not uh, mean online yet. And uh, but I think this from this list uh, a year ago, you can uh, uh, get you can sense that uh, uh, where our graduates go. And uh, uh, there is also uh, a, about uh, 10 to 15 percent of our graduates go on to uh, PhD program, graduate school to uh, PhD programs. And uh, those are not actually listed uh, on this uh, slide. So. Thank you, Dr. Hume. So the final program director we'll hear from is Dr. C.J. Taylor. He is the program director for our robotics department. And please remember to include all your questions in our chat and we'll address them next. Good afternoon. I think the next slide is ours. So, uh, as we said, my name is uh, CJ Taylor. I'm a faculty here in the Computer and Information Science Department. I'm also part of the uh, GRASP laboratory, uh, Deputy Director and the Director of the uh, Robotics Master's Program. Just want to welcome you again to this, to this webinar. Um, so, the uh, Robotics Master's degree is actually a little bit uh, unique in the sense that it's administered by the GRASP laboratory which is actually an interdisciplinary research group here at Penn. We have faculty from pretty much all of the uh, departments, uh, computer science, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering. We have faculty in bioengineering. We collaborate with people in the medical school. So um, our, our webpage, the GRASP Lab uh, webpage, lists uh, the faculty. There are 19 uh, of us. And um, as part of our uh, academic uh, engagement, we host this uh, robotics uh, master's program, which again, uh, as I said, sort of um, pulls students from a wide variety of backgrounds. So we accept uh, applicants from, uh, again, all the programs that would be what were, were, were named. So electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, um, uh, computer scientists, uh, bioengineering, we've had people apply with business backgrounds. Uh, so it's a very wide and eclectic uh, group that we attract to our program, um, all of whom are interested in learning about this field of, of robotics, uh, uh, which and we think is an appropriate way to proceed because robotics as a field is, uh, in fact, very, uh, very interdisciplinary. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about the, um, about the curriculum. Um, let me just uh, let me move on to the next uh, slide. And perhaps the most uh, useful piece of information that I can give you there is the program website, which uh, will have much more detail than I'll be, we'll be able to cover, uh, cover here. Um, so that website lists information on um, application process, information for prospective students, details our curriculum, and also points to a long list of our alumni, uh, which, are, uh, which are listed, uh, uh, listed there. Uh, the application deadline, as you would know, it remains February 1st, which is concurrent with all of the other programs that we're talking about. And our, our current population, as you see there, is on the order of 125 uh, students, and we give you sort of a breakdown of what that, what that looks like. Um, so uh, again, a question that, that comes up, and uh, we'll, we'll be providing more information there, but uh, um, the GRASP laboratory is, is one of the um, foremost laboratories for uh, robotics um, uh, in the world. Uh, uh, we are we are one of the most prominent. That could, that's reflected in our um, presence at the most of the robot, major robotics conferences and uh, in our research funding and the like. Um, uh, our the students that graduate from these programs show up in all of the the uh, the robotics uh, venues that you'd expect. So uh, Google, SpaceX, to Zooks, to Waymo, Boston Dynamic. Skydio, Amazon Robotics, uh, DJI, Sun Microsystems, Facebook, all of these people have uh, graduates from our robotics uh, master's program. And we continue to build that um, community, uh, which uh, is reflected in our uh, LinkedIn group and in the, the long list of alumni that you can see if you, if you visit, our, visit our webpage. 
Um, let me just uh, give a couple uh, comments again on the curriculum. Again, you can find much more details on the web page. Um, the program requires 10 course units. Um, and uh, of those uh, 10 course units, we designate sort of four foundational areas, uh, artificial intelligence, robot design and analysis, control and perception. And the idea is that you have to cover at least three of those four, four areas uh, with one course. Uh, of the remaining courses, we expect you to take uh, eight uh, courses that are, are technical electives, which again, you will see a complete list on the, on the, uh, um, on the webpage. It's a bit too long to go through, but would cover everything from computer vision to machine learning to um, uh, biological uh, uh, robotic systems to legged robots to flying robots, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's actually, actually a rather long uh, uh, list. We try to be uh, uh, as comprehensive as we can, and we are in a fortunate position in that, as we said, we have 19 faculty sort of teaching uh, uh, topics in this area, as well as uh, the resources of the rest of the School of Engineering and Applied uh, Science. Um, you have the option, if you were to matriculate, to take a uh, uh, either a full year thesis or a uh, one semester independent study. This is not required, but for those who are interested in delving into uh, research and taking advantage of the uh, research uh, capabilities of our faculty, uh, that option is, uh, is available to you. And again, I would encourage you to, to look through the description of the, of the curriculum that's provided on, online to get uh, uh, an even better uh, perspective on what that looks like and how that might uh, help you in your academic uh, pursuits. Okay, I think I'll leave it right there. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. So now we'll give time for questions and answers. And actually, I'll let uh, Dr. Boon Thaolu introduce himself and manage this section. Sure, sure. Uh, I guess, can everyone see me? So I'm uh, the Associate Dean of uh, all the Masters and Professional Programs. And uh, welcome all of you to this uh, webinar. And please don't be shy to ask any questions that uh, you may have. Uh, we, we got our first question on um, somebody who joined a bit late today and missed out the early introduction by Dr. Uh, Kana uh, on the Electrical Engineering Master's Program. Uh, so this webinar will be, uh, it, it's recorded um, and we will make it available on uh, online. So you'll be able to watch this uh, uh, after this event as well. Um, so, but if, if uh, there's any specific questions that you have about electrical engineering, um, feel free to type it into the group chat and um, we, will, um, uh, we will take this question in real time. All right, um, so there is uh, another question, which is on uh, financial aid, whether it's available for uh, master's students. Uh, so the, uh, this answer is actually a little bit, um, uh, so by default, if you come in here to do a master's degree, uh, you, you have to, so there's not, no financial aid available, however, um, a large number of our master students uh, who do well in classes, they do get hired to be teaching assistants and research assistants. And earlier, Dr. Kanta talked about uh, within the material science uh, master's program, uh, there's funding available for research. And that also applies to a number of our master's programs. And also, uh, a lot of our master's program uh, these days are uh, a good source for our PhD program. So we oftentimes, uh, students who do well, they, they continue on to do a PhD, at which point they would be fully funded by, by the university. Um, so, so and, and the other thing to note is um, uh, for students who do not have PhD in their horizon, as you heard from uh, these uh, our four faculty directors. Uh, this is a pro. Uh, this is a, a, a patent engineering attract uh, all the best students around the world. 
which also means we have very good reputation. And so as a result, a lot of our students get placed in a lot of top companies. So I think that that helps a lot uh, in terms of the initial investment uh, you're putting into your education here. All right. Um, so the next question that has come up, and please, you know, feel free to continue uh, sending your questions, um, is on uh, assistantship opportunities in electrical engineering. So I've given you kind of the broad uh, view of uh, assistantship opportunities across the school. So maybe I will let uh, Dr. Kana uh, chime in here on specifically in electrical engineering. What are some of the kind of RA and TA opportunities that you have seen EE master students uh, participate in? Uh, yeah, um, Dr. L uh, Liu said it very well about the opportunities in research and TA. I know that is my biggest resource for finding TAs for my master's level classes is who did well in my class last year. Um, additionally, you know, to put some specifics onto it, I, get, <clears throat> I can tell you that, you know, there was a student uh, last year, he graduated in the spring of last year. He took every single one of my classes. He TA'd for both my digital VLSI class and my digital signal processing class. He did research with Dr. Fruz Alfotuni, who I mentioned earlier. He taped out a chip while he was here at Penn, and now he's on, he went on to Cornell to do his PhD, right? So, you know, the opportunities are there, but there's no list that you can look up and say, oh, these professors are looking for these uh, you know, research opportunities. We actually do have a jobs board where you can find the TA positions available for all of our classes. Um, but you know, it's a little bit of you meeting with the professors, taking their classes, reading their publications, and showing them that you're motivated and interested in what they're doing, and you have the background knowledge for it. I do want to mention one thing, though, I forgot to mention earlier. Um, within electrical engineering, we have uh, very nice and very thorough facilities, honestly the best I've seen in any of the academic institutions I've been in, called Deck Kidding Ketterer Lab. And they're where we hold a lot of our undergraduate lab courses, um, but they are open to all of our students, master students included. And every year our lab manager, Sid Deliwell, he always taps master students to be assistants in the lab. And they are lab liaisons to our to uh, the faculty members where if we need to run a lab in the course, they assist us on testing our lab or ordering equipment. And so that's a big opportunity to get hands-on experience. And I've heard from a lot of past students saying that that experience really helped them in a job interview or helped them in their other research or helped them in a course. So that's a big resource we have. And you know, uh, part of that is um, a lot of students involved in eSEGA, our ESE Graduate Association group, they, they form this community to learn about these opportunities. And it's a student-run social organization. They run a bunch of social events, um, information sessions, and it's, it's very helpful to kind of learn what is going on in the department. Um, you know, the, the word of mouth amongst the students is invaluable. Uh, I'll pass it back on to Dr. Liu for more questions. Thank you, Dr. Kala. Actually, I want to give an opportunity if any of the other directors want to talk about in your experiences with RA and TAs uh, within your programs? Yeah, in uh, mechanical engineering, certainly we, we, I mean, we have uh, I mean, similar kind of opportunities for TA, right? uh, for students uh, doing well in a particular class, and uh, they will be uh, paid to uh, do, uh, do this job assisting uh, a particular class work. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, we have uh, uh, every year up to five uh, the merit scholarships uh, for students that are uh, interested in doing research. Uh, and uh, for students that uh, basically have their career path uh, planning to do a PhD, that is uh, definitely a goal. At, uh, so the, the scholarship is uh, in form of uh, a tuition up to $5,000 per semester uh, for two semesters. Uh, so the requirement for that is the student had to, me, had to uh, uh, prepare a proposal and outline the work they plan to work uh, under the advice of a faculty advisor. 
and uh, authorize the project, uh, and then at the, I mean, uh, there is a committee reviewing that uh, and the issue award up to uh, five awards uh, every year. All right, thank you. Yeah, I would just uh, again chime in from the research side. Uh, um, uh, uh, the the grass laboratory is not uh, uncommon for master students to be involved in uh, research projects as, as paid um, research assistants. Like currently, I'm supporting four students as um, uh, research assistants on various funded projects that we have. Um, again, this is not something that we would uh, I guarantee. It, it, it's very much. Uh, uh, I think. The, one of the beauties of Penn is that it's uh, small enough that the idea is that uh, students and faculty can get to know each other, that they can, you can actually go and talk to somebody and see if there's a, there's a match. Um, so it's a much more informal process. I would say that it does happen. Um, uh, yes, it's, though it, it would hardly, it would, we would not be in a position to guarantee that everybody would be able to get, the, get a position. Oh, that's great. Um, I think uh, the, pretty much you heard the answers for, for the other programs and material science is no different. Uh, if students do very well in the course and show an interest in perhaps an area by working with a certain uh, reserve, uh, faculty member, it's very well possible that in their second year they may be taken as TAs. And I think that's what distinguishes uh, Penn Engineering and University of Pennsylvania from many other schools. The school and the university spend a lot of effort in providing resources for students so that everybody does well. And the TAs and the RAs, the teaching assistants and the research assistants, they do an invaluable job in helping students go over the lecture material that was presented by the professor, help with homework, help them with the exam questions and so on. And these opportunities do exist and as other program directors stressed, it's not a given that every master's student will become a TA, but the best of the best do get, uh, do become TAs and they provide invaluable service to the faculty. And uh, I cannot um, but be thankful to those students who actually sometimes know the material even better than the professor because they teach a class of 50 students one-on-one -on -one sometimes. So, yes. That's great. Uh, so I hope this uh, uh, answered the... Let's move on to our next question. And this is about space robotics. So there is a, a question uh, from a, a prospective student interested in the robotics master's program and uh, uh, has uh, read up on computer vision and haptics. And he, he would like to find out or learn more about space robotics. Oh, it's a, it's a very interesting area. Um... Uh, again, our program is really designed to provide you with the fundamentals that you need to tackle a wide range of problems. So the introductory coursework would be on sort of fundamentals of uh, mechanisms, control, perception, all of which actually uh, is relevant to both terrestrial robotics as well as space robotics. We have definitely had a lot of uh, robots that, of uh, graduates that have gone into that field. We have several graduates at uh, SpaceX. Uh, some of you might know that was a, um, a company followed, funded by Elon Musk. We've had uh, multiple students that are NASA supported in our laboratory um, right now. So uh, we have good connections with places like uh, JPL, uh, not NASA, um, and we've definitely seen our students be recruited into this, uh, to this general uh, area. Um, yeah, I don't know that we don't have a course right now that's sort of focused on space as a particular uh, uh, area. Uh, but uh, definitely the kind of stuff that we, we, we teach uh, ends up being useful for that area. Right. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Um, our next question relates to uh, dual degrees. This is a great question. So I'm going to try to answer that from the school perspective, and I'll let different program directors chime in their own as well. So it turns out that um, one of the big selling points of Penn Engineering is that you not only get an education in your specific area of interest, but we also make it easy and flexible for you to diversify. For example, it's not unusual for students to do two master's degree. Um, each master's degree typically need 10 classes to graduate, but we allow students to overlap all of these classes. So you can actually get two master's degree in, uh, in, in 16, by taking 16 classes which typically students can finish in about two and a half years, although sometimes they do stretch it out to three uh, uh, to kind of better 
coincide with the job search cycles. Now there's a lot of variety on this uh, dual degree. The specific student asked about robo, so I'll let Dr. Taylor speak more to that. But I'd like to mention that from my kind of a school vantage point as associate dean, I've seen a lot of interesting combinations. For example, a material science student can do a dual master's degree in MCIT, which is a, 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 a master's degree in computer technology, specifically tailored for students without a computer science undergraduate degree. So it kind of uh, gives you a good blend of uh, material science uh, and actually in a lot of areas of engineering, we're moving more and more towards computational methods, right? Being data-driven. So having skills and knowledge in, in machine learning, AI, uh, knowing how to apply that to material science, to mechanical engineering, uh, I think that kind of gives you much uh, 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 kind of differentiation when you actually go out on, on the job market. Uh, uh, I also want to mention we, we have dual degree opportunities with the Wharton School as well, so you could apply concurrently to engineering and also to Wharton. And uh, in, in selected engineering program, we have actually streamlined the requirements, so it's possible for you to finish both degrees in two and a half years. All right, so um, with that, I'm actually going to hand it over to Dr. Taylor to talk a little bit more about, because uh, the students specifically ask about robo, uh, dual degrees you have seen in the robotics area. Okay, um, yeah, no, dual degree is definitely something that we support uh, also within uh, robo. I would say, though, um, I would encourage you to, um, uh, on coming in, uh, be planning to apply to, uh, to robo first in that uh, we accept uh, dual degree applicants at the same cycle as we do regular application uh, applicants. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, e either way you're going to go, to go through that uh, application process. Um, it is not uncommon for our students to, to do du dual degrees in with fields like uh, computer science would be a popular one, um, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, um, that is certainly uh, something that happens. Um, though I would say the majority will, will, will you know, simply uh, choose to take a, a, a degree in, in robotics just because of the time. Uh, the 10 course uh, sequence, um, students can finish that, you know, almost they're always within two years and sometimes within as little as three semesters. So um, for students that are looking to um, quickly get out onto the onto the job market. That's an attractive option. Though I will say that the the the, the, co the uh, uh, a complaint I hear often from students that do that is that they wish they had more time to spend because there's so many courses and that you know and, and it just goes by really really quickly. So um, so yeah. So that sometimes is a reason that people choose to stick around and do a second uh, master's in order to give themselves more time to explore the curriculum. All right, so I wanted to give uh, actually the other directors a chance to talk about dual degree. Yeah, let me add that uh, in the actual process of applying the dual degree, you don't need to consider when you applying at the beginning. So in the sense that uh, when you apply to pan, pan engineering, you basically uh, apply a primary degree program. For example, when you enter into mechanical engineering, you basically uh, in the uh, applying process and apply the single degree uh, uh, master's in mechanical engineering. Then once you come to Penn and at least after first semester of study, and they can start uh, considering uh, add a secondary degree on top of your primary degree and consider this uh, dual degree program. Uh, that's the normally the process I think we handled it. So I think at this stage, you keep that uh, option open, and uh, once you join the pen and make a decision, normally at, after the first semester, decide uh, when, whether you want to do a dual degree or not. Um, as uh, Professor Bintolu and uh, Professor Taylor and Professor Hu have mentioned, dual degrees are indeed a very popular route for masters in material science. Um, I would say that about 30, 40% of students opt for a dual degree at uh, beginning their second semester or even in their second year. And uh, the reason is uh, these students have done very well in academics in their first semester, and they are eager to give themselves as broad a foundation as possible at Penn using the 
world-class resources we have to enter the ever-changing world that they are facing now. And so as we were telling you about getting research TA opportunities, it's wonderful if the student does a great job in their first semester, it opens up numerous windows, namely opportunity to apply for a dual degree in a CIT computer science program, which is very popular, but there are other programs. Data science is one of the most popular dual degree programs that our master's students want. And uh, it can also open up opportunities for research as well as for TA and create internship jobs over the summer. So. That's right. really the message. All right, thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, Kanka. Uh, so we, we have uh, another question on whether it's possible to complete a master's degree in one academic year. Uh, so, so let me try to take that question and I'm sure other directors can chime in. Students typically need to take 10 CUs to graduate and biotech requires 11. The most common combination we have seen is 3322. I'm not talking about soccer formation here. This is three classes uh, in your first semester, three in your second, and then in your second year, fourth semester, when the job search is in kicking into high gear, students usually take two classes and then they wrap it up with two in their final semester. Um, that said, it's totally possible to finish in a year. The, a typical combination I've seen. Uh, would be something like four two four, right? So you do four in your first semester, you stick around. Uh, sorry, um, four four two. Sorry, uh, that was a bit of, again. I'm getting confused with soccer formation here. <laughs> <laughs> so four in your first semester, four in your second, and then you do two over the summer and you finish in the year. That's it. I think that unless you are choosing classes that are not that uh, time intensive to do four classes in a semester is going to be quite a lot of work. So um, you should do this with um, caution. Uh, and also as a third case, which we don't see a lot, but it happens, is when students have taken uh, graduate classes at other universities, they're allowed to transfer two classes in, at which point they have eight left and they could do like a 3-3-2 and it's possible to finish in the year. Anyone want to yeah, let me add uh, the special situation since that the uh, uh, pen has some agreement. Uh, I mean, uh, we normally I mean with other universities, so we call it a salary the master degree program. And uh, some university that as they are, I mean, junior undergraduate student, they could uh, jo enjoy that. Uh, I mean, uh, this benefit of this program. That means so that while they are undergraduate, they can take some graduate level courses, and up to three of those graduate level courses can be count towards the master's uh, degree requirement. And uh, then out of the three, plus there's one additional years, two semesters of study, uh, that's possible to uh, graduate, uh, I mean, uh, after, I mean, four, I mean, after uh, four years of undergraduate plus one additional year uh, study at the Penn to finish the degree, I mean, master's uh, degree is what the um, That's great. So uh, we, we are slowly running out of time, so I'm going to speed up a little bit on the questions. Uh, but I think there's a couple more interesting questions coming. So, yeah. And for those of you who could stick around past the time, feel free to do so, uh, so we could get through all the questions. Uh, so the next question is, when I'm meeting students, uh, how much weight do we put into undergraduate research uh, publications? Um, I would say that it varies from program to program. I can let the director speak to more. Uh, uh, each program has its own criteria. Uh, but I would say that uh, 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 in addition to getting good grades, uh, given how competitive these programs are, I think every little thing that you could tell us about yourself uh, whether it's publications, whether it's a professor who can write you a very strong letter or recommendation for something that you've done, um, all of that gets uh, taken into account. Uh, so we really look at your, your whole application. Uh, but that said, if you don't have publications, please don't be discouraged from applying. There's many outstanding master students that we have admitted uh, that uh, didn't come in with research publications, so don't let that deter you. All right. Okay, so the next question is, um, 
there's a student interested in systems engineering um, and his curriculum is quite flexible uh, and but how that interacts with robotics. Uh, so actually, this is a, a more general question. If you look at a lot of our master's programs, uh, there is certain level of flexibility, right? So once you finish the core requirements, uh, you start taking the electives and then you can choose to, uh, to concentrate on one area versus the other. Uh, and for example, in systems engineering, you could, for instance, um, uh, do a deeper dive into uh, a data science or you could do a deeper dive into, uh, into a kind of intersection with robotics and so on. Um, so I would say that uh, we, we are quite flexible here to cater our curriculum to, to your needs. And, um, and a lot of our, we don't have a systems engineering faculty today, uh, but I would say that a lot of our systems engineering graduates uh, go on to uh, very interesting careers. And actually that's a, a, actually, uh, a, a, a large sizable number of our dual degree students with Wharton actually came through systems engineering because uh, uh, operation research has a good overlap and synergy with uh, business analytics. So that's a, a kind of a popular dual degree option. All right, so the next question is actually on, on MIMS. So I'm gonna okay. direct this quickly to Dr. Howard on uh, uh, how flexible is it to do collaborative research in different concentrations, such as uh, mechatronics, uh, micro, nano, design, and uh, manufacturing. So, and actually the student broadly is also asking about concentrations. Yes, but, uh, the concentration is, I mean, kind of, I mean, defined that, uh, I mean, uh, according to the things that I mean, just outline. But the faculty research is not, <clears throat> For most cases, those are the multi I mean, discipline in the sense that they don't really I mean, uh, work in the single area. So suddenly, when you come in, uh, declare a concentration, that is something kind of a flexible. So you, you choose uh, a particular concentration when you apply and when you admit it, okay, into the program, you can switch between those concentrations, okay. And you can see that uh, I mean, on the, the course outline I mentioned earlier that, that you have you select a core course and a core elective in that concentration, but beyond that uh, you are actually required to select the uh, courses outside the con concentration and cover the the background the, uh, in the area in mechanical in outside your concentration area. So in sense that uh, uh, once you uh, I mean at the time you apply you simply pick a concentration but on once you join uh, the program, you can switch, and uh, the courses you can select certainly outside your concentration. And uh, uh, things that the student interest change over time, so that happens actually quite often. But, uh, so it's not uh, in sense that uh, a cast fixed that you cannot uh, you cannot uh, change. Yeah. All right, great. Um, Thank you, Dr. Howard. So the, the last one last question, and by the way, these are all great questions. So if we couldn't get, hold, get to additional questions today, or if you happen to be watching this webinar uh, later on in the recording, um, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, actually, there's two more questions. I'm gonna take the last two. The next one is on, um, I think broadly speaking, flexibility of switching programs during application. So for example, if you have applied to program one, um, you may not know whether you're a good fit and whether your application should be routed to program two instead. I think this is a common problem because um, actually also because our departments don't work in silos, right? There are overlaps between mechanical and robotics, overlaps between uh, chemical, CBE and material science and so on. Uh, so this is a, something that we, we often encounter. So I would say that um, if you are unsure, reach out to the program coordinator. Actually, uh, we, we have a slight listing all the uh, program coordinators and also the faculty directors themselves. Um, if, for example, um, you reach out to say the computer science uh, coordinator uh, uh, and, and he said that uh, you may or may not be suitable, um, what you could do is also to reach out to uh, the, the alternative coordinator so that um, if uh, we deem that you are not suitable for one, uh, with your permission, we may uh, move your application to the other. We have done that in the past, 
It doesn't require you to resubmit a brand new application. We'll just be copying from one to the other. Um, that said, we don't want students switching programs on the fly while being evaluated. So I would say before you apply, please do your due diligence, talk to the coordinators, um, attend our web chats, talk to the faculty directors, and to try to help you uh, find the best program given your background. If, if I may, I mean, it's also possible if, if this is a good strategy for you to, to apply to more than one program. Um, that way you'll be evaluated by um, uh, in, in two different uh, piles because the evaluations are typically handled with by separate committees so though I understand that's more work on, on your part but you know, well. okay so the, the very last question is about GIE threshold so um, so here at pan engineering we evaluate every application as a whole right we we don't necessarily say okay if your GR is below a certain score, we're not going to look at your application, right? So um, you may, um, maybe you, you had a bad day while taking the GRE, score isn't exactly what you want, but you have um, high GPA, strong letters of recommendation. Um, so please don't let that deter you from applying. Uh, I guess the takeaway is we will look at your application in its entirety, right? We have admitted students, for example, who uh, may not have fantastic GRE scores, did great research, and then there are other factors that we look into. Uh, and, and certainly in your application, in your statement of purpose, uh, if you have anything that you want to highlight, um, make it easy for us to evaluate and, and admit you by, by pointing those out to us. And if I could just chime in on that, you know, like Dr. Lu said, oh, can you, yeah, I'm sorry, I just wanted to chime in on that real quick. Um, to echo Dr. Lu's sentiment that we look at our applications as a whole, and um, to kind of come back to the other statement about uh, looking at publication counts, um, you know, in addition to all of those things, I want to see uh, a profile of a person, right? So you know, again, make it easy for me to see any project work you've done, list it in your statement, put it on your resume, you know, tell me what important classes you want me to pay attention to, um, you know, things like that. But again, like Dr. Liu said, we evaluate as a whole, not just as a GRE score. Uh, Christina Burton. Well, thank you all for joining us for our first uh, graduate admissions webinar. Your questions were very important, and we hope that we gave you an answer that will help you make a really important decision for your future. We will be hosting future webinars, so stay tuned. You will receive an email and other updates through our social media outlets. Uh, please follow us um, on Facebook and Twitter. Our information is provided there. And Happy New Year to you all. We look forward to hearing from you soon. Take care.